just start by saying, you know, this is Adam gave me a reasonably terrifying job, which was 45 minutes to distill the essence of leadership. And I've sent him about, I don't know, three texts saying, Adam, this is frankly terrifying because um, there's so much, um, so many things I could have drawn on, so many references, so much discussion and conversation about leadership. So can I just start by saying, I'm not an expert in leadership, but the Menzies Foundation um, is very, is really genuinely and deeply interested in this conversation. Um, we, um, we're focused on um, really uh, looking from Sir Robert Menzies' legacy, not in terms of any partisan or any with any particular agenda, but really to use the hindsight of history to reflect on the qualities that made him the leader that he was, um, in some ways even separate to the politics and really much more interested in his leadership journey, the great things that happened, the not so great things that happened, the lessons he learned on the way. And this little slide sort of shows how we sort of take that um, perspective um, the sort of qualities that we admired in him and then really understand what they are in the context of the world today. So the, the foundation, the reason we're here today and we're partnering with, we're so delighted to be partnering with Adam and Swinburne University, is we really, the Menzies Foundation seriously aspires to raise the profile and importance of outstanding leadership. And we do that by supporting leads, leaders and leadership initiatives with the capacity to make catalytic change to improve Australia's future. We genuinely hold ourselves to catalytic change, and by that we mean systems change. Our model is basically this. It's the guiding principles are to honour the leadership legacy of Sir Robert Menzies, the man, not necessarily just the politician, to invest in areas of national importance, and most important to, importantly, which is why this group is so diverse in terms of where you come from and the perspectives that you bring, to leverage the power of multi-sector collaborations to drive impact. We really fundamentally believe that the opportunity for innovation is in the different views that people bring to solve the problem. Um, and so with that in mind, we uh, identify strategic areas of focus and support initiatives that build collaboration platforms to harness partnership expertise and resources for impact. We build incubators to unlock new innovation and we codify those insights and disseminate, disseminate the learnings with others to develop systemic interventions to scale the initiatives. A bold ambition, but absolutely genuinely, um, we're genuinely serious about that. And already in our work, we can see the power, as I said, of wading into those areas where people don't necessarily agree, where they use different languages and different ways of thinking in a problem or thinking how to solve a problem. There is great power in that to move out of what you know into what you don't know and to ask yourself to listen to others' points of view and resol in resolving a way forward. Just quickly, our areas of focus, the national critical areas of focus that we're focused on at the moment are school leadership, Indigenous women's entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and science, ethical leadership in young people, cyber security and the law and citizen leadership and resilience. And we look at the lead and we take the incubators and the work we do with that. And I'm so grateful that many of you in the room today are people who are working with us on these initiatives and it's your perspectives and the richness of your insights that we're hoping to really garner and learn from today. We leverage those insights, that understanding into the leadership discourse. The Hackathon's an example, doing some fabulous work with Genevieve Bell at ANU around what system engineering is for next generation leadership and one of the, every time I meet Genevieve I learn something extraordinary. One of her really poignant points to me the other day was the importance of history in order to understand the future, which as I said, sometimes I think it's easy to disregard history, but it's, it was a very interesting point that she made about how we need to think about what we want to become. And the, and the Menzies Leadership Forum. Uh, and as I said, the incubators give us the insights around leadership and allows us to move in these ways. So the question for us really is, are we in a mess? I've had some directors, Terry and Harvey and others on this call who, you know, it's question, 
the um, negativity of that question, but I think it's a really important question to, answer, to ask ourselves. Are we in a mess? On what basis or foundation are we starting from? Uh, and there was a fantastic article I found about in the state of the world and how, in fact, things aren't nearly as bad as we think. Over the last couple of hundred years, for example, extreme poverty has been declining drastically. Uh, there's an increased satisfaction globally with lives as income rises. Childbirths become less deadly. Child mortality is steadily declining. Violence is declining. Increased spending on, there's increased spending on social welfare generally and higher rates of education. So on one measure, the world's looking better. We're actually moving forward in many positive ways. But the bottom line is, as we are aware, um, and this data is based on um, a great um, piece of work the Pew Research Centre does, which looks at how people across countries, 14 different countries in the world see problems. And they sort of say, you know, the key problems that the world is facing are things obviously like global climate change, the spread of infectious diseases, not surprisingly in a COVID or hopefully COVID normal world or COVID-19 world terrorism, cyber attacks from other countries, the spread of nuclear weapons, conditions of the global economy and global poverty and the long-standing conflict between countries or ethnic groups and large numbers of people moving from country to another. These are the seminal issues that people globally around the world are most concerned about. In terms of Australia's leadership challenges, and these are ranked from highest to lowest, these are the challenges that Australia most perceive as most important to them. And I think there's something interesting in this. Cyber attacks from other countries is the highest, the greatest concern that Australia has. The spread of infectious diseases, once again, not surprisingly. The condition of the global economy, and fourth, global climate change. The spread of nuclear weapons, terrorism, global property, global poverty, the long-standing conflicts between countries or ethnic groups, and large numbers of people moving from one country to another. That's the hierarchy of our concerns as a nation. Something to reflect on later when we think about uh, and answer or address some of the questions we're going to ask you to contribute to later. What's fascinating for me is global climate change is number four, that people are much more worried. I think this, uh, the cyber attack, the spread of infectious diseases, the conditions of global economy is an indication of how people are feeling about themselves personally, about their personal lives. So what is the leadership performance? How are we going on leadership? I'm indebted to the work of Dr. Sam Wilson um, and the Graham Foundation. Sam's based at the Social Innovation and Research Institute at Swinburne University, a colleague of Adams, who's developed the Australian Leadership um, Index, which is a very useful uh, way to capture the general, uh, you know, where we are in leadership. So the, um, the ALI is the largest ongoing national survey of leadership for the greater good. Each quarter ALI surveys 1,000 people across Australia regarding their beliefs about leadership for the greater good by Australians across a range of institutions and sectors. And this slide shows you the multitude of um, the institutions and sectors that they consider. So the ALI is a nationally representative sample and ongoing picture of public perceptions and expectations of leadership for the greater good in Australia. It addresses three basic aspects of leadership. Uh, it's the perceived state in institutions across a variety of sectors, the expectations about what it should be, and the factors that drive public perceptions of leadership for the greater good. The purpose of the ALI is threefold, to serve as a representative measure of public perceptions of leadership for the greater good, to describe and track public expectations of leadership for the greater good, and to provide insight into what different institutions and sectors should do in order to improve perceptions of their practice of leadership for the greatest good. So what is leadership for the greatest good? Uh, the ALI concludes that it's useful to think about the greater good and leadership in service in terms of value, namely the types of values that need to be created, regenerated and sustained in order to promote the survival and flourishing of life and to sustain the well-being of the whole. In other words, the approach to thinking about the greater good calls attention to the types of values that we seek to create, how we create value and for whom we create value. This approach to thinking draws attention to the types of values that institutional leaders seek to create, how institutional leaders create value and for, who, and for whom they create value. In sum, leadership for the greater good in Sam's word occurs when institutional leaders endeavour to create value for their stakeholders and society in a manner that is transparent accountable and ethical. 
I think this slide's a really interesting slide. This is the sorts of predictors of leadership that Sam and his team evaluate when looking at this question of Australia's performance in terms of leadership. Um, and you can see there's a range of things that I think, as I said, when we think about leaders, give an interesting breakdown into the sorts of ways that you think about your own leadership or how we think about others. Things like the balances and needs of different groups, how responsive people are, whether people are creating positive environmental outcomes, positive social outcomes, things about transparency, accountability, understanding the interests of society and demonstrating high ethical standards. It's a useful list to keep in mind as you think about yourself, as I said, and those that lead you. So what is the key insights? What does Sam find out in, the, in 2020, or in 20, actually this is 2019 data? His conclusion is a little damning. Against a backdrop of unethical conduct, irresponsible leader, leadership, and a distrust of institutions, there's a growing expectation that leaders and institutions should create value, not just for themselves, but for society as a whole. This slide is a snapshot of where we find ourselves. Overall, neg negative 13. The government sector, though I'll talk a little about post-COVID in a minute, minus 20. The public sector just marginally above the line. The private sector, minus 15. And even the not-for-profit sector, minus six. As I said, that summary at the top is a little concerning. So the government sector is perceived as showing the least leadership. The public sector is the best, is perceived as the best performance, but even that's only plus seven. And as I said, the private sector is poor and even the not-for-profit sector doesn't seem to fare so well. This is a breakdown of, those, of the institutions in those subsets. And once again, overall, the public takes a dim view of the state of leadership for the greater good in Australia. The majority of Australians feel that institutions and sectors do not do enough to lead them for the greater good. I think that's pretty indicative that we are in a mess, to Adam's point before. There's a significant gap between public perceptions and expectations across all indicators of leadership for the greater good across all sectors. Australian institutions are not living up to the expectations of the general public. At the sector level, the government sector is perceived as the worst performer, followed closely by the private sector. Um, charity organisations are perceived as showing the most leadership for the greater good. Uh, community expectations for the greater good are the highest for the government sector and especially for the federal government. By contrast, community expectations are lowest for the public se private sector, lowest for the private sector, especially of small and medium sized enterprises. The most pronounced gaps between perceptions and expectations of leadership relate to the accountability, transparency and ethicality of institutional leadership. That finding is consistent across the government, private, public and not for profit sectors. Uh, local is better is really interesting. I think particularly in a post-COVID or a COVID-19 world, local is better. Small to medium enterprises are more positively perceived than national businesses, which are more positively perceived than multinationals. That's not so surprising. And local governments, interestingly, are more positively perceived than state governments, which are more positively perceived than the federal government. Not surprisingly, the pandemic's twisted some of that uh, in an interesting way. Prior to the pandemic, as I said, the public had a very dim view of the state of leadership in Australian governments. But since the pandemic, there's been, for the first time in a year and a half, public sentiment entered positive territory for governments, and those perceptions have improved week by week. Uh, the importance in public perception is most interesting because the bushfire crisis was a disaster for the federal government. Um, and, but in some ways, that the trans, um, trajectory of people's feelings about the government has changed from a low in the bushfire crisis to a much um, more confidence um, in the government's response to the pandemic and how that's happened. And the patterns for the results of state government is almost the same. What about around the world? The Edelman Trust Barometer reveals that despite uh, the Eagle is an annual trust uh, and credibility survey that's now in its 20th year. Um, and it's become a global, it's now recognised globally as, uh, you know, a fabulous indication of trust across the world. The latest data in their 20th year from the Edelman Trust Barometer says that despite a strong economy and new and near full employment, none of the four social institutions that the study measures, government, business, NGOs, and media is trusted, none. The cause of this paradox can be found in people's fears about the future 
and their role in it, something I think we saw in the Australian data, which are a wake up call for our institutions to embrace a new effective way of building trust, balancing competence with ethical behaviour. Edelman concludes that there's a growing sense of inequity is undermining trust. Since Edelman began measuring trust 20 years ago, it's been spurred by economic growth. This continues in Asia and the Middle East, but not in developed markets where income inequality is now the most important factor. A majority of, response, of respondents in every developed market do not believe they will be better off in five years' time, and more than half of respondents globally believe that capitalism in its current form is now doing more harm than good in the world. The, resu the result is a world of two different trust realities. The informed public, wealthier, more educated and frequent consumer of news, remain far more trusting of every institution than the mass population in a majority of markets. Less than half of the mass population trust their institutions to do what is right. There are now a record eight market showing all time high gaps between these two audiences and alarming trust reality and alarming trust inequality. So to trust has been driven, driven by a growing sense of inequality and unfairness in the system. The perception is that institutions increasingly serve the interests of the few over everyone. Government, more than any other institution, is seen as least fair, though interesting Edelman's uh, more current work shows that, in fact, since the pandemic, trust in government has increased. 57% uh, of the population pre pandemic say governments serve the interests of only a few, while only 30% say that governments serve the interest of everyone. Edelman worryingly concludes that fear eclipses hope. Against the backdrop of growing cynicism around capitalism and the fairness of our current economic system are deep-seated fears about the future. 83% of employers, I will get into that in a bit later. So what, we really get, what this really shows is that the issue, Edelman concludes, is that we require higher levels of cooperation among our institutions. No single entity can take these complex challenges below. And as CEO of the Menzies Foundation, that's the point I made before, we need sectors to work together to bring multiple perspectives, to walk into the differences in order to forge new ways of addressing the complex challenges that we face as a world. So there's some of the breakdown of the, I should say, first of all, you can see Australia's down at 47, um, which, you know, is frankly in the orange in a state of distrust. So Australia's ranked 47 in a state of distrust. Edelman concludes, as the, as the title says, we're living in a time of continued distrust. Society leaders not trusted to address challenges. People today uh, basically, as I said, put their trust based on two distinct, distinct attributes, competence, delivering on promises and ethical behaviour, doing the right thing and working to improve society. And once again, this slide shows you, as I said, in summary, I do not have confidence that our current leaders will be able to successfully address our country's challenges. No institution, most worryingly, is seen as both competent and ethical. The key criteria to build trust. Uh, and as I said, so as you can see, um, only business is seen as competent, only NGOs as seen as ethical. But most institutions are seen as unfair a damning and worrying indictment of where we find ourselves. So what impact is this having on the world? How is this lack of trust, this concern about leadership manifesting in our lives? Well, social dislocation is one of the really key concerns. And we can see in this slide, um, which is from the Edelman Trust, that this idea of people in, the, uh, in these countries who believe that their families will be better off in five years' time, the majority in 15 out of the 28 markets are, pe are pessimistic, and you can see Australia at number 32 there, down two. The majority of people desperately fear being left behind. Once again, as I said, majority concern in 21 of 28 markets, and as I said, we can find Australia at, num at 53. An enormous and very deep concern about the worrying about the future of work. 83% of people worry about losing my job due to one or more of the causes in this slide.
in, in uh, thinking about this and in, in responding to this, there's been an extraordinary number of articles and commentary about the recent American election. And as I said, I think it's worth reflecting on that because I think it gets to the heart of some of the issues uncovered in those recent slides. So David Brooks writing in the New York Times in August of this year said, you know, thought reflected on what's happened in America and our American colleagues will be interested to get their views said that Republican politics, uh, politics in the 80s and 90s were about limiting government spending, spreading democracy abroad, uh, building dynamic free markets at home and cultivating people with vigorous virtues, people who are energetic, upright, entrepreneurial, independent minded, loyal to friends and strong out foes. There was no doubt there were limitations about this. He said it was comprehensively anti-government. There was no way to use government to solve problems. Uh, in his words, it was so focused on cultivating strong individuals that it had no language to cultivate a sense of community and belonging. He concludes, Bannon and Trump got the emotions right. They understood that Republican voters were no longer motivated by a sense of hope and opportunity. They were motivated by a sense of menace, resentment and fear. At base, many Republicans felt they were being purged from their own country by the educated elite, by multiculturalism, by militant secularism. Middle-class Australians have been betrayed by elites on every level, he concludes, political elites, cultural elites, financial elites. The modern leadership class has one set of values, globalisation, cosmopolitanism, and the middle Americans have another set, family, home, rootedness, nation. Corporate elites have concentrated so much power, in his words, that they now crush, crush the Yoma masses. Richard Lowry, similarly, in the only middle finger available writing in the National Review essay in October 2020 says, Trump is, for better or worse, the foremost symbol of resistance to the overwhelming woke cultural tide that has swept along the media, academic, corporate America, Hollywood, professional sports, the big foundations, and almost everything in between. To put it in blunt terms, for many people, he's the only middle finger available to bandish against the people who've assumed the whip hand in American culture. And when I looked at all those participant profiles, I thought to myself, are we woke? And the question that I, one of the questions that I really want you to take home with you today is, are you woke? And if you're woke, what are you gonna do about it? Because just to declaim and to say that you disagree or you feel uncomfortable about what we've witnessed in the US is not to step into the responsibility of what that is and what responsibility we have to, in David Brooks's world, the, um, the mass versus the middle. The second big trend on that happy note is new forms of organisation. Um, and this is having a profound impact in terms of how we think about leadership and the way we think about our response to it, how to build it, how to engender it, how to encourage it. Um, recently, there's been some interesting work around Generation X's, um, the last political advocates, uh, activists. Um, another article which shows that Australians are turning away from active involvement in the major parties and civic groups. Young and digital natives dipping in and out of issues, are dipping in and out of issues rather than joining organisations. General Social Survey recently from the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows measured participations or participants have plummeted 50% in the last decade. 9.4% of adults had been involved in a civic or political group in the last 12 months. In 2010, it was 18.7%. The proportion of people aged 15 to 24 participating in a political party, trade union, professional association, human rights, animal welfare, environmental protection is down to 7.1%. Volunteering, uh, in 2019, only a quarter of adults undertook paid voluntary work compared to 2006, where a third of adults undertook voluntary work. Uh, ANU political sociologist Ad Adrienne Varane says citizens, especially young people to quote, relevant to, um, reluc are reluctant to join traditional political groups, which are seen to be rigid and hierarchical. And, and concludes, there's a, a cynicism and a distrust around organised politics. There is so little room to participate in the major parties that people are doing it on their own terms in an ad hoc way, which is so much easier with the rise of online petitions, digital platforms and groups like GetUp. 
This is a really key and important question for us. The old forms of organisation are becoming less relevant, less important. There are new platforms for how we think about how we galvanise and um, create new concepts of leadership, new opportunities for participation. And this is a really important part of the considerations we're going to have later on today. There's also enormous and significant distrust of the media. One of the interesting sources from the um, Edelman Trust was this just idea that the media I use is contaminated and, and untrustworthy. 57% of people in the world believe that about the quality of information they've got access to. 76, up six points between 18 to 20, worry about false information or fake news being used as a weapon. I was telling Adam that one of my, um, one of them, for entertainment, my husband and I would flick between CNN and Fox recently throughout the American election, and it was like two different worlds. They were just completely different. There was no consistency about the information. Frankly, you were just feeling bemused about the information that was being fed to you, and very, very difficult to discern or get a sense of actually what truth was in that context. Finally, there's this huge worry about technological advances. Once again, from Edelman, huge concern that technology is out of control. 61%, the pace of technology, the pace of change is too fast. 66%, I worry technology will make it impossible to know if people are seeing or hearing what is real. 61, government does not understand emerging technologies through to regulate them effectively. So all in all, I think it's probably fair to say that I'm glad we're sitting in this room today contemplating many of the concerns that people have around leadership and drawing our attention to what things we can do to think about how in Australia and globally, we can take steps to address that. And in some ways, I think we have, a, there's a line in the sand. COVID-19 has created a new world for us in many respects, I think. And this idea of the fourth industrial revolution, Adam's focus for this leadership hackathon, Genevieve's focus for the sort of leadership attributes and competencies that we need as we move forward in the world, I think also provide a platform, a reason to think that there is a time now where it makes sense for us to take responsibility to step up and to think about the change. And some of these things, um, just by to cause burn discussion and to um, outline the sort of thinking that we're seeing at the Menzies Foundation, is this idea that COVID um, and the uh, technical um, innovation has unlocked chase, change and pace at magnitude. It's resulted in everything in thinking and moving bigger and faster. Many organisations have accomplished what they had previously thought was impossible in response to COVID. Um, quotes, um, and I'll send, you'll get this pack, so you'll get all of this, but I keep pushing myself and our team to think about how to use this inflection point to reimagine our potential together. I think is a great call to arms, as supposing to allow our organisation to just go back to the comfort of let's sweat doing what we were doing. Michael Fisher, who's CEO of the Cincinnati Children's Medical Centre Hospital. I'll just repeat that. I keep pushing myself and our team to think about how to use this inflection point to reimagine our potential together. I think that's a call out to all of us. CEOs, as a result of COVID, are recognising that barriers to boldness and speed are less about technical limits, something that we always, I think, fall behind, and more about such things as mindsets about what is possible, what people are willing to do, and the degree to which explicit or explicit policies that slow things down can be challenged. That suggests this is an opportunity. I mentioned before this idea about capitalism has failed, that there's a general and strong view that capitalism as it currently manifests have failed us. And McKinsey, in a recent report, have talked about the emergence of this idea of stakeholder capitalism. Many CEOs, in fact, 181 CEOs committed to this idea of stakeholder capitalism by recently signing the US Business Roundtable's statement on the purpose of a corporation. And, many, and these CEOs did so because they've begun to embrace the idea that their country, company obligations to shareholders should not come as an expense at any other stakeholders. The pandemic has brought this issue to the fore. It's emphatically affirmed the intention and the interdependence of business with stakeholders. Once again, another opportunity. Robert Smith, CEO of Vista Equity Partners, a private equity firm with 60 companies in their portfolio, says, at the beginning of COVID-19, CEOs sit right into thinking about shareholders above anything else. It was almost muscle memory. 
But then they realised that at every turn they were bumping up against different stakeholders, partners, governments, suppliers, employees. They are experiencing the interconnectedness of stakeholder capitalism in everything they did. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, going forward, there's going to be a lot more focus on society, customers and clients, family and employees. COVID-19 and the pandemic has laid bare the interconnectedness between business and the broader world in which they operate. And I, I would extend that, frankly, to multi-sectors, that, multi, that all the sectors now realise, as they have had to in COVID, that we need to find new ways of being, thinking and working together in order to address really serious global challenges. The other idea that I think is really preeminent, certainly in our work at the Menzies Foundation, but also in everything that I read and see is the harnessing the power and importance of networks. This idea of the importance of networks, of accelerating impact on shared challenges because of understanding what network opportunities prevail, either be formal or informal. That humility, a learning mindset and an open-minded commitment to ongoing development that taking yourself and building networks out of woke, out of who you know, or how you know them, or who's economically aligned with you, but truly understanding the power of collaboration and networks is a key and important pathway for all of us as we create the future that we want to create in Australia and in the world. Once again, Edelman says, building trust for the future depends on four key things, paying fair wages, addressing economic inequality, focusing on education and training, the leg up, embracing an all stakeholders model. So, uh, as I said, across all dimensions of conversations about who we are and what we have to become, an all stakeholders model is absolutely preeminent. And this very important focus on understanding how to partner and collaborate across institutions. So what does leadership 4.0 look like? Who are the sorts of people and the sorts of leaders that we need to become? A survey of 2,000 global executives and senior managers of companies with revenue between 50 million and 5 billion uh, were recently asked about their confidence in their leadership and the sorts of leaders they had to become. And I think the results are illuminating because I think this is the base that we're starting from. Only 15% of employees in those organisations felt confident that their leadership could deliver long-term success, 15%. 24% reported very low confidence. 95% agreed that managing disruption will be vital to the success of their organisations, but 85% lacked confidence in their own leadership team's ability to navigate through disruption. And only 16% say disruption has been well managed to date. Now these are corporate figures, but I, you know, I have, I would need to do a bit more work, but have every confidence that these are sorts of levels of concern that exist, that exist across um, leadership cohorts, across institutions. And as the Ogdes Bernstein Leadership Confidence indicates, there is a clear crisis of confidence in top global leaders. That's our task today. How do we understand that? How do we come to terms with it? How do we think about addressing it? So wanting to end on a more optimistic note, there's also plenty of insights and interesting thinking about the key elements of the leaders that we have to become, of what we need to go, what we need to think about as we move forward, as we take responsibility for our own leadership and for building others' leadership capability. And one of the ones that I really thought was the most interesting in this regard was um, a recent report from Emma Burnmar, Head of Impact, Innovation and Engagement at the World Economic Forum, who basically says there are four types of leadership that will define the future. The first is the architect. Great vision and navigates and curates complex systems. Architects build contextual intelligence. They understand interdependencies. They embrace complexity and they connect the dots. This requires a long-term and informed approach to decision-making. The architect, once again, collaborates with different stakeholders and shapes environments and structures that empower and engage people. Now, Amy's on this call somewhere from Genevieve Bell's centre again. Genevieve said to me something the other day that was profound in this regard. 
that makes me eulogize and love architects even more. She said, uh, engineers solve problems, architects resolve problems. We need more people who can resolve problems in the world, not be problem solvers, be problem resolvers. Understand the power of interdependencies, complexity, and how to think about connecting the dots. The second uh, leader that Emma identified was the learner. She says, like any great design entrepreneur, this type of leader fails and learns fast. That's why Adam, I love the idea of a hackathon. They are playful, open-minded and creative. They know how to take calculated risks and lead at the edge while showing vulnerability. They recognise their weaknesses and seek advice and mentorship from others. This leadership promotes an agile work culture. The third type is the steward, the type of leader who leads with purpose and intent. They believe in shared and sustained value creation and work to connect organisations and people to a purpose with a long-term mandate of creating social value. Stakeholder capitalism manifest, I think. This type of leader takes responsibility to understanding the outcomes they're designing for. And finally, the mentor. The leader puts people first. They seek to unlock the potential of others, lead with empathy, energize and develop the next generation. This type of leader is mindful and inclusive, embraces the power of diversity, collaborates and facilitates and creates psychological safety. The leader is authentic, a word we more and more often hear about one of the crucibles of leadership, inspires and engages by asking great questions and uses storytelling, uh, creates an emotional commitment and leads by example. So they're the, they're the archetypes of the leadership model that we need to think about and build for the future. Emma pulls this together into a system leadership model, which I think is a really excellent snapshot of the types of way we need to think about leadership and how we build those, um, how we build that model. And she concludes, as we, in her words, as we draw closer to the 50th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum this year with the theme, Stakeholders for a Cohesive and Sustainable World, it's a poignant moment to reflect on what kind of leader we want to be and what kind of leaders should hold the license to lead. The license to lead. She concludes by saying, let's make 2020 the leadership of design. Benjamin Forbes um, in August 2020 talked about Jack Morgan's new book, The Future Leader, and it, uh, based on interviews of more than 140 top CEOs from around the world. And on basis of these interviews, he put together the notable nine, he calls them, the top four mindsets and top five skills that leaders must, matter, must master. Uh, he talks about the global citizen. He says the world's becoming increasingly connected, which means that every business has the potential for worldwide employees and customers. And the mentality of global citizens means thinking globally and embracing diversity. In his words, leaders need to understand and appreciate new cultures, actively seek diverse teams, lead employees with different backgrounds and know-how to enter and succeed in a, new glo in a global world. He talks about the servant, Mindset of service means that you practice humility, that you serve four groups, your leaders, your customer clients, your team, and yourself. He talks about the chef, balancing numerous ingredients to create masterful meals. Leaders must embrace the two most essential ingredients, humanity and technology. Humanity and technology. Embrace technology to improve efficiency, whilst also providing a sense of purpose and caring for humans. One can't survive without the other. And finally, the explorer, like explorers of old, must embrace, embrace the unknown. You need to be open to new ideas and change the course of the world around you as it evolves. Learn continually, practice curiosity. The skills, coach, motivate, inspire and engage your team. The futurist, make sure your organisation isn't surprised by what the future might bring. Consider multiple scenarios, think about new possibilities, stay on top of trends and once again, be connected to networks. He concludes this is the number one skill according to those 140 interviewees. Be a technology teenager, be current on the latest technology. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to embrace the technology and know how best to leverage it. In his words, be tech savvy and digitally fluent. 
be a translator, a master communicator. Most importantly, listen to understand and do more than hear what people are saying. Use verbal and nonverbal, hard on Zoom, Adam, to use nonverbal, to connect with people and know channels to cut through the noise and deliver the message. And finally, be Yoda. Leaders have shied away from being emotional. Future leaders are emotionally intelligent. Focus on empathy and self-awareness. Great communicators build connections. They aren't afraid to be vulnerable. They have strong empathy. They understand feelings and perspectives of others. It requires considerable self-awareness. So the question for us today is how do we get traction? What's going to make a difference? The Menzies Foundation's experience in this regard is we have to prepare to walk into what's difficult. We have to be prepared to find the areas of conflict of the greatest difference, because that's where people have the greatest opportunity. That's where the traction is, where most people feel the heat because they want to change something, because they're furious about it, empowered about it, confused about it. And my suggestion to us today is that's what we need to do. We need to go into those areas we don't want to talk about, the things that are more difficult to discuss, because it's in the difference. It's in the difference that the answer and the future lies. So in leaving you today, I'd just like to reflect on this um, quote from Albert Camus, who that I often read, because every now and then the Menzies Foundation, to my directors on the call, gets into a bit of hot water because we do go into those hard spaces. We do try and build opportunities for new thinking by bringing together multiple perspectives. And I find this inspiring. My dear, in the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. I realised through it all that in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes it me happy, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes again within me, there's something stronger, something better, pushing right back. And so, Adam, from the Menzies Foundation, where were we, where are we now, and what do we need to do? I think we can agree that we're certainly in some sort of mess and we've got a responsibility to do something about it. I really hope you ask a question about how woke you are and what you're going to do about it. What can we do to make leadership 4-0 a reality? Can we draw a line in the sand? And I ask you how you're all going to make a difference. Thanks very much. Thank you.